In this video, we're going to cover how to determine member forces by inspection. This is a really powerful method because it saves you a lot of work. If you can identify the answer easily from inspection, you don't have to do an equilibrium calculation. We're going to be looking at these three joint configurations. If we identify a joint configuration that looks like one of these three pictures, we'll know what the answer is. When I draw these lines, they can represent truss members or applied forces. In the descriptions below, I'll just use the word forces for brevity. The first diagram shows two pairs of collinear forces. The second diagram shows one pair of collinear forces and the third force off at an angle. And the third diagram shows two forces at an angle to each other, but not right in line with each other. Let's do some basic equilibrium calculations to see what the member forces are in these different conditions. And I'll start at the very right. If we use an inclined axis system and we look at equilibrium in the y direction, there's only one force or member in the y direction. And we know then that by equilibrium in the y direction, that force is zero. If we look in the x direction, well, there's only one additional force. Equilibrium in the x direction says that that one remaining force has to be zero. So in the case of two forces at an angle to each other, both forces are zero. Moving to the middle diagram, if I use the inclined axis system shown, once again looking at equilibrium in the y direction tells me that the inclined member is zero. Equilibrium in the x direction tells me that the two collinear forces are equal to each other. I've shown that by a variable named A. The forces in line with each other are equal, and the other force is zero. The last case, we'll jump straight to the answer, and that is each pair of forces has equal magnitude. And I've indicated that here by the variables A for one of the pairs, and B for the other pair. Now let's see how we apply this in an example. Here I'm showing the example truss. I'm showing the three joint configurations from the previous slide. I'm showing an assumed loading on the truss and the reactions that must be there to maintain equilibrium. Before we get started, I'd like to think about how difficult it would be to solve this by the equation of joints. And if you count, we have seven joints in this truss. There are two equations of equilibrium for each joint, so we would have to solve 14 equations. This is doable, but if we can simplify the work, why wouldn't we? What I've shown here are the joint configurations, and that's all that I'm going to be focusing on. Just the joint configurations, I'm going to be going joint by joint and identifying whether the joint configurations are the same as one of the three joint configurations that are on the top of the slide. Let's start at the lower left. That joint configuration is not like any of the configurations shown. There are three members all at different angles to each other. I can't say anything, but I'll mark that joint as checked. Moving up and to the right, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. This joint configuration looks like it has two pairs of members or forces, each in line with each other. That's the left-hand figure. And so we know that each of the pairs is equal to each other, and I've indicated that with the magnitudes A for the vertical member and the vertical force, and B for the diagonal members. We'll label that joint as checked. Let's move down. The joint below doesn't look at all like any of the three diagrams. It does have two members in line with each other, but it has two other members coming in at different angles. That doesn't look like any of the other diagrams. We'll just label it as checked and say that that doesn't give us any information. Looking at the topmost joint, that also doesn't give us any information. It doesn't look like any of the three diagrams on the top of the screen. Just label it as checked and say it doesn't give us any information. Moving down to the bottom of the truss one panel over, that also doesn't look like any of the diagrams up above. We'll just label it as checked and say it doesn't give us any additional information. Moving up, this does look like one of the diagrams at the top, namely the middle one. 
we know that the two members that are in line with each other have equal magnitude forces and the vertical member which is the one that's off to an angle has zero force so we'll label those use the variable C to indicate the two members with equal forces and label the other one as zero and we'll mark that joint as checked moving to the last joint again like the first one that doesn't match any of the diagrams up on the top so we have no information from that joint we'll just simply label it as checked now when you're using this technique if you ever find a zero force member you need to go back through the truss because if you call a member a zero force member for all intents and purposes it's not there and if you remove it conceptually from the truss you may find other joints that now reveal additional information that you couldn't see before. So let's do that. I'm showing the zero force member is dashed. Well, remember that it's there physically, but there's no force in it. So the joint configurations have been modified accordingly. You'll notice that the two joint configurations at either end of that zero force member are now simpler. The top joint, there's nothing new there. We already consider the configuration of that joint in determining that it was a zero force member. But if we look at the bottom joint, when we remove the zero force member, we can now see that that joint looks like one of the joint configurations that we have at the top of the slide, namely the middle one. The two members that are in line with each other have equal force, and the diagonal member is a zero force member. So we identify those there as additional information that we were able to identify by inspection. Now, we once again found a zero force member, so we need to conceptually remove it from the truss and repeat this process of double checking. Here I'm showing that new zero force member dashed out and the two joint configurations suitably simplified. And let's focus now on the joint configuration at the top of the truss. In that case, the new modified joint configuration doesn't look anything like the three diagrams on the top. It just has three members coming in at arbitrary angles. So we gain no new information. We simply label that as checked. And now we've gone through the cycle to a point where we haven't identified any more zero force members. Now we're done. We've finished identifying member forces by inspection. You've seen an example of the first two diagrams at the top of the screen. For this truss, we haven't used the third diagram. We'll finish this problem by considering how much simpler the equilibrium calculation now is. If I do my two equilibrium equations for the rightmost joint, I can identify the two forces labeled as C and D. I already identified that those forces are equal to the forces in the adjacent members and I've also identified the zero force members. So two equilibrium equations at the joint shown in blue tell me all of the information that's shown with green check marks. If I now go to the joint at the top of the truss with two more equilibrium equations I can find the force in the member labeled B as well as the other diagonal member. The member labeled B also tells me the information on the other side of the joint with two collinear members. I incorporate the information that I already knew from inspection that the vertical member force is equal to the applied load A. I only need one more equation of equilibrium at the bottom joint to determine the force in the one remaining member. So I've reduced the size of the problem. Now I only need five equations on only three joints versus 14 equations before. I don't know about you, but if I'm given the choice of solving 14 equations of equilibrium or only five equations of equilibrium, I'll choose the latter. In closing, I want to just clarify a question that often comes up. Why are those members even there? If they're zero force members, well, why do you have a member? There's two answers that I can give. One is that the loading configuration may be different. And if the loading configuration is different, those may not be zero force members. But there are still some members that are in trusses that will never actually be loaded. If you recall from strength and materials or mechanics and materials the concept of buckling, you'll recall that the compressive capacity of a member 
decreases as its length increases. So sometimes in trusses, we insert zero force members to effectively reduce the length of the member and to make more efficient use of material. A classic example of this is in electrical towers, where many of the members in there turn out to be zero force members, but they're required for stability of the very long members. So with that, we finish this example. The main takeaway here is that we have these three diagrams at the top of the screen. Your task is to go through a truss, look at the joint configurations, see if those joint configurations match the diagrams at the top of the screen, and if they do, apply the known results. That will greatly simplify your equilibrium calculations.